when I'm like making fun of the fact that it's bedtime to my children, <laughs> this is the song I will sing. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome to another episode of 1001 Album Complaints, the show where musicians, friends, and critics get together to break down a classic album from the list of 1001 albums you must hear before you die. We'll fill you in on the context behind the band and the album, we'll play a few select tracks, and then we'll vote on whether or not you actually need to hear this album before you die. Now, I just want to say at the outset, we are all musicians, we appreciate music, we all record music on a regular basis, so look, we totally get how hard it is to create good original music. But we all know everything has a little bit in it to make fun of, so fair warning, we're going to take a few shots at this album, but it's all in the name of good fun. The word complaint is in our name so you already know what you're getting into but we just want to put that out there at the outset so my name is alan i'm a lifelong musician and today i'm excited to talk about an album that rolling stone once listed as number 36 on its list of the greatest stoner albums of all time <laughs> so i'm assuming it's an automatic yes for everyone on this call and we can just yeah. it seems like an odd list well i think they only came out with one version of it in like 2013 so they probably realized they had their fun with it and went on their way by the way the chronic came in at number 28 on that list so this is in some pretty good company i would say but we are not here to talk about The Chronic. We're here to talk about the self-titled debut album from Seattle indie folk band Fleet Foxes. Let's give you a little taste of what we've been listening to all week with a clip from arguably the most popular song from this album, which is called White Winter Hymnal. I was following the eye, 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 was following the With that clip fresh in our minds, let's go around the room and introduce our key players tonight with a quick tweet length review of the debut album by Fleet Foxes. Let's start with Marty. In economic theory, the law of diminishing return refers to the idea that as you add production <laughs> factors to a project, output will eventually decrease. The law of marginal utility states that as a consumer consumes more of a good, the additional satisfaction they receive from each additional unit decreases as well. This album by Fleet Foxes is an excellent example of both of those things. <laughs> Sorry, I fell asleep during your tweet, Marty. I, I think that's what Ben Stein was referring to when he talked about voodoo economics in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sure an economics professor from somewhere in the middle of the country is going to write in soon. Tell Marty where he's wrong. Yeah, was this just a, a job application for Marty's future <laughs> economics uh, career? All right, uh, let's let's move along to Phil. Hey guys, uh, good to see you again. Uh, good to hear from you again. This week on on Fleet Foxes, I would say 18th century chamber folk meets 1960s California beach surf. <laughs> Well, you, you don't have any economic theory to uh, <laughs> underpin your hey, argument? I'll make it make sense. No, I, I'm, I'm digging it. <laughs> All right, let's hear from Rob. Thanks, Alan. This is Rob here. I'm going to keep mine short and sweet, true to the tweet length review as it was conceived. Beautiful singing and deft production that only a jaded hipster wouldn't love. Okay. All right. Sounds Dig like it. it's getting 
It's getting personal early. (laughs) (laughs) We already have uh, shots fired against the format of the show. Can you hear a big difference between Parliament and Funkadelic? Are you able to name the members of Wings who aren't Paul and Linda? And are you intimately familiar with every track on side six of The Clash's Sandinista? Then Discography is the new podcast for you. Discography is a music obsessive's dream come true. Our friend Dave Gebro and the guest explore an artist or band's entire recorded output and rate everything from zero to five stars. Some of the show's many amazing guests have included Jim Florentine doing four episodes on Black Sabbath, Lou Barlow rating the zombies, members of Pavement doing a five-parter rating their own work, Mike Watt rating Minutemen, Anthony Fantano on The Velvet Underground, and Bob Mayer on The Replacements. He's also been releasing three shows a week for over a year in one of the most active Patreons humanly possible. You're not going to want to miss it. Discography is available wherever podcasts are consumed. We recommend you subscribe and listen. Okay, well, I am Alan here, and my tweet length review, not so short, but... Who among us hasn't wondered what it would be like to take a few bong rips right before going on a road trip through the hills of medieval England, only to end up in a reverb-soaked church cathedral greeted by an angelic chorus of bearded Seattleites? Oh, wait, you, uh, me either. I haven't either. But <laughs> if you can spare 39 minutes of your life, this record will get you pretty close, I think. So Fleet Fox's debut album, this is... You know, this is one of those albums where I know we've talked about this in the past, where the newer the record is, it's hard to really gauge its sort of longer term impact. So we'll we'll talk about sort of where we think this fits, how we think it connects to the musical canon. But I'd love to just hear overall impressions. What what would you all think in, you know, going through a deep dive of this record? I remember when this album came out, I might have like downloaded it off a blog or something like that. And hearing it and and immediately being like, oh, this is a good album. But kind of alluding to what I said in my tweet length review, it got tired for me quickly. The songs are super catchy, but I think a catchier, catchier songs tend to last with me shorter and shorter as I get older and older. The other part I'll say is, is parts of this album feels like they're just kind of being cheap. It's like, okay... Everyone loves harmonies. So let's put a 65 part harmony on <laughs> on every on every song, you know, and repeat. Does everyone like harmonies? <laughs> I think so. I think that's like I think that Hold on. How is that how is that not the formula for so many of the other bands we love at all times? Isn't that Steely Dan's formula too? Effectively? I, mean, yeah, I don't know. I I, th- I think that you know, four part harmony is one thing. I swear some of these songs it sounds like there's like a hundred layers of vocals reverb dog yeah i guess <laughs> yeah I, listen i think we're already getting away from the fact the first part of what you said resonates with me much more which is this is a very pleasant album i think it's quite easy to like and there's nothing inherently wrong with that the band has a formula sure but the formula feels like a winning one to me and I'll tell you more things. I I can get into more specifics about what I like about it, of course, but I will say that I had listened to this mostly as background music in the past and enjoyed it, thought it was easy to like, but this week gave it that deep headphone listen and felt like it was much enhanced by that, which is really pleasantly surprising. Yeah, I I think that's great feedback, Rob, and I think something you said that like I'll echo is it's a very pleasant record to listen to right and i think we could talk like i'm excited to talk about some of the sort of things that i think are making it pleasant personally so this is like on a very short list of records that my kids listen to at bedtime right so like to me like it's it's both peaceful but also like they're like singing about squirrels and shit and like sometimes i'm wondering <laughs> like you know like this. scarves decapitating <laughs> you know <laughs> But I like that, yeah, there's a little hint of darkness in there, too, that, that I'm sure true. we're going to get into. True. Yeah, I, You know, I think it goes, for me, the, the question I'm trying to answer is, it's, it's the, you know, it's the must question again. It's like, why wouldn't you listen to Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Beach Boys records? There's like a, you know, I'm trying to, I'm really trying to ask myself, like, is this so good that it it, it surpasses those? The, the synthesis of those sounds is is a whole new thing that must be revered. 
I don't think that's the only reason to listen to something, though, to be clear. I Listen, I'm not I'm coming into this conversation undecided on whether it's a must listen, but I did enjoy the record. Right. But those For are two sure. different things, as you're saying. But let's just get it out of the way right now. It doesn't have to be brand new on this planet to be a must listen. I don't believe that anyway. I agree. So this group and this album, but really their most of their catalog borrows unabashedly from you know a lot of the groups that we're gonna probably talk about like the Crosby Stills Nash and Young Beach Boys you know sort of Brian Wilson thing but I do think it comes up with something that's really original like I can't think of really anything that sounds exactly like this so I you know I feel like they have done a really good job of pulling from their influences but creating a wholly new thing out of it. Like when I listened to this, I think I made a joke in our, um, on our, when I named the focus list for this week, you know, I think this is as good as deja vu. I don't actually think that, but I also don't think it sounds like that either, but I do think it holds its own really with some of those classic albums. And I think for me, like I was familiar with this, with this group, like, like a lot of people, I actually think I own one of their albums that isn't this one, but they came onto my radar back when I was listening to a lot of Pandora back in like, you guys remember that back in like 2007, 2008. So this was just being served up to me constantly alongside bands like the shins and modest mouse and that whole sort of indie scene from back then. So they've always been on my radar and they've always been a band that I've thought, yeah, they're actually like kind of good you know kind of sing songy but i think like you rob when i went back into this album i found there to be like much more than what my initial sort of perception was you know just based on on a handful of of songs personally let me jump in and talk about the crosby stills and nash and maybe the beach boys comparison and in the process i'll tell you two things i like about this record and i think they're going to be themes for me one is On Deja Vu, the singing is confident and almost masculine, save for Neil Young, who's his own thing. And Robin Pecknold has a very, there's a, his voice has a great fragility to it that I really like. I don't think the Beach, I think the Beach Boys dabbled in those waters on stuff like God Only Knows, but that's not even Brian Wilson singing. That's like one of his brothers, right? So to me, that sets it apart right away because all the stuff on Deja Vu, the lead vocals and the harmony vocals just all are coming at you as a wall of confidence. And this has this ghost-like dreamy quality and also the way they consistently produce it with reverb throughout the record. The other thing I just want to call out right away is I think the production on this is so, so deft and perfect. And the mix, there's so many elements coming in and out of this, including all the voices. And I just got a hat tip to the mixing engineer in particular. Well, it's interesting that that's your takeaway. I agree. I think it has, it's, I think it's very balanced and it has, you know, we've already joked about like reverb and I'm sure we'll talk about that, but it's almost like there's like a fleet Foxes button that like a (laughs) plugin that you can push and it, and it just enables a sound that's pretty consistent throughout this. And, but what's interesting about that is the recording was very like haphazard for this. It happened in a lot of different places. They recorded this right before they actually got signed. So it was, there was a lot of like DIY recording a track in somebody's basement, then recording in someone else's living room a week later. But the end result I do think is something that has been pieced together in a very cohesive way. Do you think there's something you unique about, I mean, do, do you think his voice is that unique? I, I get what Rob was saying is like, I don't want to listen to every newer album and expect, and only like the ones that are like something brand new, but I feel like there's ways to interpret your influences that are maybe less cheap and transactional. So I want to just make sure that, you know, to to give that distinction there between and not make it seem like I'm just like a total hater. I just think that's assigning a lot of intentionality to a person you don't know. And I think particularly when you're talking about a first record with made without a label's backing, I guess Alan's going to tell us the background, but he just dropped that tidbit in. I, I just don't think that's how musicians think. They're not thinking about ripping off somebody. They're certainly inspired by others, but I sense tons of sincerity here. Yeah, I do too. And I think the, 
you know, you mentioned the vulnerability in Robin Pecknell into his voice. And I do think there is a there there is a vulnerability there. What's interesting, and, and I think what underscores that is he actually re-recorded his vocals a number of times because he was there is that sort of maybe it's not a lack of confidence, but certainly a lack of like assertiveness or a lack of truly believing that what you're putting out is good. In fact, I think I saw a quote where after they recorded this, he sort of wanted it to fail just so that they could get on to recording the very next album. So I think that spirit of some hesitance does kind of come through and and actually has some, some real world, you know, sort of backing behind it. But I I think even, you know, we're talking a lot about the vocals and things like that, but I, I actually feel like in the songwriting, I felt like this was a really a breath of fresh air in terms of songwriting. I feel like it takes you somewhere where you're only hearing the music, but I feel like in a way it's like hitting different senses in a way that I can't quite articulate that when I listen to these songs, I feel like I've actually been somewhere and that I've had an experience. And I think they do it in a pretty sort of minimalist package where these songs are really three to four minutes long, but they, in my mind, they feel very expansive and they feel like they've taken you places. And, you know, I don't, I feel like they don't go back to the same hooks over and over like you would hear in a normal pop song. You know, maybe they come to a hook once or twice and then kind of leave you wanting a little bit more. That was my kind of read on the on the songwriting aspect of it. What do you guys think? I definitely think there's an sort of unconventional songwriting structure that also still feels like pretty fluid. You know, they go into these like sort of early Grateful Dead breakdown segments, you know, that are kind of cool, you know, and like psychedelic and feel, I don't know, like natural. Like they don't feel... Like they're lifted right out. I don't want to say I don't I don't, don't want to say they're lifting things, but like it doesn't feel as reminiscent as like the the Beach Boys sound that I get a lot of, sort of paired with the Crosby, Stills and Nash like thing. In my mind, they're very melodically strong, and as less maybe strong lyrically, but the specific kind of melodies they employ, and we'll get into it with the songs. They all have this lilting loop-de-loop quality some of the songs they literally do around with the melody but even when they're not doing that there's just a circular nature i think bell and sebastian uses this technique a lot i can't quite put my finger on what music theory wise is happening but what it leads to in the arrangements i think it begets some of those unconventional structures because you don't always have a lot of places to go with melodies like that they sort of peak and then resolve and kind of come back to the beginning as opposed to leading you to the next part. So what I hear in the arrangements a lot is the breakdowns, the resets, the dropouts. Do you know know what I'm saying? I think these things are interlinked, but I do think melodically it's very strong and it doesn't sound like other things. They sound somewhat like traditional songs. In fact, the Beach Boys song I, I might reference would be Sloop John B., which I believe is a traditional song that they reworked. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And based on some of the research I did, there seemed to be a sense that that Pecknold was stitching some ideas together where, you know, as he was constructing these songs, he would go back to these little motifs that he had that that weren't fully baked and that he was doing a little bit of sort of like mix and match and trying to find these parts that he could thread together. And I think... I feel like you hear some albums where that's clearly what's happening and it doesn't work and things don't feel like thematically linked. But I feel like the the stitch work, I guess, for lack of a better word, is actually pretty clever and seems to work really well. They're good at stitching parts together that are different, but it works. And the other thing I would say about their melodic sensibility is that that creates the kind of instant gratification if you're hearing this album for the first time. Totally. All right. Let's talk about Flea Foxes a little bit as a band. Rob, you mentioned in our text thread that you wouldn't be surprised if like a decent segment of our audience hasn't heard this band. Maybe it's just the era that we grew up in or the period of music that I was streaming heavily at that time. 
I find that a little bit surprising, but I do, I would hundred percent agree that this isn't, this band is not like a household name by any stretch of the imagination. This album was released on June 3rd, 2008 by Sub Pop Records based out of Seattle, pretty famous for ushering in some grunge music and also a lot of indie rock that we've mentioned already but also a label called bella union which i think is a uk label that maybe handled the british distribution of this record not clear if there was some sort of partnership there but they're listed as the co uh, record label for this album and again this was the the debut full-length album for them who when they recorded this record the band consisted of robin pecknold who we've talked about a bunch already he was really the guy primary songwriter guitar player. What's interesting about the rest of the band though is when you look at the the credits, they don't really list out who played what. They just list the name, band member, songwriter and arranger. Everyone has the credit of band member and arranger. And then Pecknold has those same credits, but also he has songwriter and design, which I don't know what the hell that's supposed to mean cuz he didn't design this cover, which looks basically like it's straight out of Canterbury Tales or or something. <laughs> if you if you look at this cover, it's it's actually it's a cool cover. It looks very innocent on its face. But if you look, it's got this Where's Waldo kind of quality where there's all kinds of shit happening. There's literally if you look close enough, there's a scene where I think somebody's actually being like serviced while they're sitting on a chair or something where the design came from i don't know but i think it's a it's a dutch painting of some sort or a belgian painting i believe it is some sort of medieval painting from like the 1500s if i'm getting my uh world history correct here nonetheless the rest of the band comprised of so you had robin pecknold skylar skiel set which by the way how are these guys not like playing for Bjork or something like that with these names. Oh, I thought you were going to say like the Montreal Canadiens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's better. First of all, Alan, they're of Scandinavian descent, but they're not Icelandic. How dare you conflate those two things? Ah, well, I don't know. Bjork's, Bjork's coming after you, buddy. I saw a J followed by a K and didn't know, really know what to do with it. So here we are. <laughs> Next three names of the band, much more forgiving though. You've got Nicholas Peterson who played drums. He came before a guy who became Father John Misty, which a lot of people associate with this band, but he was not actually on this original recording. Uh, then you got Casey Westcott, who was keyboards, and Craig Curran, who played bass. I think they swapped him out later on. Alan, that, that might have been slightly confusing to the listeners. There's a separate indie musician called Father John Misty, who started out as the drummer of this band, but he is not on this record. That's what you're trying to say. Well, yes and no. So he th- he didn't get his start with this band. He actually was sort of a well-known singer-songwriter in the Seattle area. He did play drums in this band for an album or two after this. So he was not on this album. But I think a lot of people are probably familiar with that, that name and know he was in the band. But he was not on this specific recording. I'm just pointing out that if you already think Fleet Foxes is indie then Father John Misty is one layer of indie deeper. <laughs> yeah, I would say that. I actually do, you know, I might get flamed for this. I think he's actually pretty good if you watch his live performances. He's wild, dude. His albums are amazing. I, I, I love them all. Great lyricist, great songwriter. Yeah, I've listened to a couple of them too. They're good. Yeah. yeah. So they did release an EP before this called Sun Giant, even though I think it was one of those Abbey Road, Let It Be things where even though it was released before this record came out, they recorded it afterwards and, you know, they planned on having it ready just as something to sell merch at, at the tour before <laughs> this album came out. Right. You're right. This is just like Abbey Road and let it be. Huh? Exactly like that. Good comparison. <laughs> I like to reach for the top shelf with, with my comparisons. Um, but just in terms of sequencing, I always found that to be interesting. Yes. You know, Robin Pecknold founded this band with Skylar skill set. <laughs> They both grew up in Kirkland, Washington, which is an affluent suburb of Seattle. Now, it's where the first Costco is, everybody. Wow. Oh, yeah. Hence hence the Kirkland brand at Costco. That Kirkland tequila that uh, you're all probably drinking right now. (laughs) (laughs) They were pretty well-to-do growing up. There's not much in the way of stories of like grit or hard scrabble upbringing. 
Although Pecknell did apparently drop out of high school to pursue music at one point, and he did some work in in restaurants or or something like that, which feels feels a bit like a very into the wild thing to do. If you've ever seen that movie, to wait to go work at a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> no, to drop out of high school while you're like a wealthy uh, kid right, because yeah. you want to like live this other life. You know, so essentially these two guys bonded over artists like Dylan, Neil Young, Brian Wilson, pretty much the exact people that you might think influenced them and their sound. In, uh, so in, in 2006, they end up forming a band and pre Flea Foxes, they started a band that they decided to call themselves the Pineapples. Now, look, what's in a name, right? But I have to think that <laughs> if they stayed with that name, there's no way this record would sound the way it does. <laughs> but luckily for them, there was somehow a local band that already had that name of the pineapples. So they decided upon fleet foxes, which according to Pecknold was quote evocative of some weird English activity like Fox hunting. <laughs> so I think this is all starting to kind of make sense. At least the aesthetic they're going for. Yeah. So that, I mean, so that's a lock. The name fits the sound for, for sure. Agreed. Agreed. And, you know, as they were forming this band and writing the initial songs, like they obviously leaned really hard into this late 60s pop aesthetic with, you know, lush harmonies, these expansive soundscapes, obviously evoking, you know, some of these old school bands that we're talking about. They started to get some heat pretty quickly. They were one of these bands that, I mean, within two years, you know, they went from basically nobodies to headlining festivals and selling out different venues and things like that. And as they were coming up, they caught the attention of of this guy, Phil Eck, who I hadn't heard of before, but apparently he's worked with a ton of bands like, you know, Modest Mouse, Built to Spill, The Shins, and... Not just work with them, but produced and mixed all the Built to Spill records, all the old Modest Mouse records, some of The Shin stuff, that Band of Horses record. Like, he has a really nice catalog, and of course this record... So good work, Phil Eck. Yeah. And what's interesting is he actually I came across a quote from when he first heard Fleet Foxes or I don't know if he heard them as a band or if he just heard, you know, Pecknold. But a quote that he said at the time that he discovered him was that it was obvious that Robin Pecknold had talent coming out of his ass. (laughs) So, you know, take that for whatever it's worth. But what's interesting, though, is they had this pretty like meteoric rise and. You know, I say that with the obvious uh, knowledge that they were not household names. They were not like wildly commercially successful, but critically, they came upon pretty universal acclaim. But what I found most interesting about this, I mentioned Pandora earlier, is one of the things that they credit for their quick success early on was was illegal file sharing. Like Pecknold has even said that without, you know, Napster and and peer to peer file sharing that they probably wouldn't still exist right now. So, you know, they sort of captured this like moment in time, I think that that was a little bit unique there. I read that they blew up on MySpace. So that's that tells you the time period right there. They have to be one of the last bands to be able to claim that. Right. Perfect segue into our by the numbers segment. One of our favorite segments here on the podcast. The first number I want to throw out at you, which you alluded to, Rob, is a quarter of a million. So that's 250,000 for those scoring at home. And that would be the number of MySpace listens within a two month period that they had in late 2007. I mean, it doesn't sound like, I mean, at that time, like the internet was, you know, it barely existed. It was like two candles next to each other sharing a flame, you know? I thought MySpace was like done in like 2006. <laughs> Maybe the that last was when Marty like, was still putting out the clap. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to explain that one for the listeners, please, Alan. Please. Okay, okay. I didn't know if that would actually make it on, but for for the listeners, the you you may all know at this point if you're avid listeners that most of the members of this podcast were part of a an outfit called the Chop, which came out of San Francisco around this time. Marty being the provocateur that he is decided to set up a MySpace page and create this entire 
fake band called The Clap. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you Google that uh, to, to figure out what that's a uh, nickname for. But actually created a song or two, possibly with some uh, drum machines and loops and things of that nature. But They were uh, very humorous. Really, it was a legit really song. Yeah, it was about yeah. you and him going to a party yeah. and getting the clap, That's Alan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot. Yeah. Right. What are the odds that that audio exists somewhere? Uh, like we... I don't know. Good luck. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder. I wonder how many. I wonder what the by the numbers are with that song. <laughs> yeah. Two. Yeah. Two listens. To Both by yeah. me. It's huge in Chad right now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So MySpace somehow was a was a huge catalyst for for their growth next number would be 815 thousand which is the amount of u.s copies that are estimated that they've sold at this point so they've for this record so they've hit gold haven't quite hit that next level yet but decent base of album sales even with the file sharing and myspace and the free music era that feels pretty substantial to me it's a lot for a band that i think most americans would say they've never heard of to be honest both those numbers are shocking to me i I would have estimated much much smaller yeah well they also did sort of ride that wave too for better or worse of being like a starbucks type of band where they were i think showing up on a lot of these starbucks cds and things i definitely saw this record for sale at starbucks Oh, you know what? Change my vote right now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, Take back everything it's, I said. It's right next to Jack Johnson's greatest hits. <laughs> Marty's vindicated. <laughs> so uh, next number is uh, two hundred thousand, which is how many copies this sold in five months following its release in Europe. So this is another one of these bands that I'm not going to say they were outrageously successful overseas but they their popularity at least rivaled what it what it did in america and and probably surpassed it slightly in the uk and then the final number i'll I'll mention here is the number six which is the number of different publications that listed this as the number one album of the year for 2008 which includes for better or worse pitchfork billboards critics choice among others so Maybe what they did not achieve in massive record sales, they definitely hit a sweet spot with music critics, for sure, with this album. How was it ranked in your personal zine, Alan? It was uh, ranked number two behind the Claps debut. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that wraps up our By the Numbers segment. And, you know, we just want to take a second to say thank you so much to everyone who's been listening to us so far. We really appreciate the, the feedback you've given us. And if you want to support the pod, there's a few really easy things you can do. You can hit subscribe, share it with a friend, but even more excited to announce that we have just launched a Patreon. Is it is it a page? Is it an account? What is what is the... It's all of the above, Alan. <laughs> and if you just want to support what we're doing, we love what we do. We want to keep delivering you good deep dives like this. And if you want to buy us a beer, it's five bucks a month. The podcast isn't going to change at all. But if you care to kick us a, a beer per month, I think it's pretty reasonable for what we do to put this together. Either way, we love you. That's not even a beer. You know, it's like almost a beer. It's not a beer in this town. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, I spent about $18 on this four pack that I'm drinking right now. So anything to (laughs) defray the uh, occupational costs uh, of this. And it does take it does take four beers for Alan to do this podcast. So (laughs) Uh, that's just during the hour that we talk. That's not, you know, this doesn't count the pregame. All right. Well, let's dive right back into the music here and revisit the track that we listened to earlier. White Winter Hymnal.
they're tied round their throats to keep their little heads from falling in the snow. Rob, you mentioned uh, a round, you know, a musical round. I think this kind of falls into yes. that category. Totally. It's really, really strong. I know we've probably all heard it a lot of times. And Alan and Phil, I'm sure you're going to mention at some point that you guys play this song in your band. And I think you even did a Fleet Foxes set recently. I'll let you talk about that momentarily. So I'm sure you're maybe a little bit sick of it. But for anyone who hasn't heard it yet, this is this sells you on the band pretty quickly. It's a well-crafted pop song. They were smart to keep it tight at under two and a half minutes. I love not just the melody, but the many touches, like the big boomy bass drum, they, they get a lot of their sound kind of packed into a short amount of time here. And I just think it really sells the band and the record. When you position it like that, yeah, it's a great ad for the band and what you will hear sort of on the rest of there's not the first song on the record, but uh, it's, it's very, I think it's the second track. It is a great ad for what's to come. Like it's, it's an interesting take. And I know I know I've been a bit cheeky about about this this uh, album so far, but I will say this this song has is in a format that you don't hear a lot in much music, in many albums, especially modern music. Uh, yeah, I agree. I I think there's very little that's like this, and I don't think the rest of the al- album sounds like this song specifically, but it does preview essentially the the types of sounds that you're going to hear uh, on this record. We were sort of talking about this earlier in our in our pre-roll, but I was actually hesitant about putting this on the list because in my mind, I actually thought this was was a traditional song that it was like a cover. And so I just sort of dismissed it as like, OK, it's just a little bit of ear candy and, and not much more than that. But it is an original composition that's been covered by a number of different groups since then. I think it's a really cool song. I'm not normally into this type of sound i was just gonna say just take a step back for your from your comment that it sounds like a traditional song from the american songbook or something from appalachia or something like that the fact that that can fool you tells you that it is a great song and that maybe it even belongs i mean flash forward another hundred years i don't know if people will still be listening to this but i think it could fit with the american tradition of songs so i just think that speaks really highly of it well here's here's something i mean put that way this song has interesting potential in the long-term songbook because like there won't be snow right so to sing about snow would be really interesting (laughs) phil phil please please phil there'll be nuclear stuff yeah yeah i think it's a great song phil and i have played this song a number of times and we did as a group dive into some of these songs for a bit of a tribute set for Halloween not too long ago. And so I've always tried to like parse these lyrics cause they're kind of weird and it's very sing songy. And, you know, I also sing the song, you know, to my children and they, they listen to it. But as I've actually delved into lyrics, it's pretty dark and weird. And so I was trying to figure out like, what do these lyrics mean? Where do they come from? It turns out, according to, to Pecknold, that they're pretty meaningless and that they just wanted to <laughs> really start the album with a simple jam that's focused on singing and a little bit of harmony. But they have then, for some reason, put another song in front of this. So I don't think the lyrics mean that much, but I do think this it's, it's a pretty cool uh, tune. I don't think he's normally lyrically that strong. And I got a nonsense sense from many of the lyrics but i'll give him credit for that little turn of phrase and turn the white snow red as strawberries in summertime it's a nice mixture of light and dark you know that that kind of airiness with that kind of oh that's blood obviously right yeah and i like that thing they do i'm sure there's a term for it but where when he says the you know in the summertime that that bleeds into the next verse so that if you're singing it by yourself, you have to sort of pick which word. Yeah, yeah, it sort of like crosses the bar line. Yeah, no, sure. Uh, this this always gave me the vibe of like uh, I remember when I was I don't know probably ten years old. I saw this cartoon. There was like these these uh, these rabbits, and they were like really violent. What's this called? Like, was it claymation or something? No, it was, it was at Watership Down, Watershed. Yeah, Watership Down. It's a book. I've never read or seen it, but. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's a thing with yeah. rabbits. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, those are pretty gruesome. Yeah, I've, uh, it has some. It has some weird scenes. It's always reminding me. Song always reminding me of that. Okay, I have a question slash complaint for 
everyone, but specifically for Marty, the drummer. Does the song slow down a little right at 1.30? hear it but it's just i mean it sounds like sounds like someone's playing a bass drum with a stick and not with their foot you know i I feel like the the drums are like three different people playing you know it's not it doesn't Mm -hmm. sound like someone's playing a traditional drum set so it wouldn't surprise me if they i I don't know added the drums to fit you know at the end of the song rather than the beginning along with the bass i see fair enough uh i'll say something about the i'll say something about the lyrics uh is, and and uh, as we go through each song, a lot of their songs they will mention someone by their first name. So so and, <laughs> that and is so, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So in this, in this song, they'll they they talk about uh, Michael. Yeah. So let's just keep that, and then we'll talk more in the <laughs> other songs about that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, you got to keep it keep it relatable. You know, maybe they're talking about Michael Jordan. Who, who knows? <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next track, which follows this on the record, but also when they play it live, they tend to sort of bucket these songs together. That song being a song called Ragged Wood. for me on this album it's just got great energy good vocal delivery and then it, it kind of we talked about those changes that they have earlier it has just really unique changes especially at the three minute mark yeah as alan mentioned like we played like a cover set recently for a halloween show and this i thought was the most fun song to play and yeah there's some that has that like saint stephen grateful dead breakdown that's just really cool it seems like out of place but it's also very no, nah, it's very <laughs> hip. It's very cool. The driving beat definitely helps it along because totally. I don't feel like that much is driven on the drums. But I would say that the coda is what really sells it for me. Maybe you guys would agree. The bass is really nice, particularly in the back half of the song. And I've always loved, speaking of, this is a very Grateful Dead or a Robert Hunter-esque line, the any old lie will do. That sounds like something I could hear Jerry singing. Yeah, this was, I agree, this was my favorite song on the album. It, this was, when when I made that comment earlier about how I, I feel like their songs take you on a journey, but it's, but then when you look back at the time, you're like, oh, that was only four minutes, but it sounded like that was like an eight minute sort of epic. They use every available inch of space without really wasting much of it. Like, I, I think they really take advantage of, each area of sonic real estate and they do a really good job i love the way that the song just starts out there's no there's no introduction it's just sort of like wall of vocals immediately and it just feels very angelic almost it feels like the sunlight's coming out it just has that feel but then it gets dark it gets proggy you know towards the middle then it ends with you know it feels very triumphant i i feel like they on this song just cover a lot of ground in what's actually like a pretty short amount of time. Yeah. This was definitely the, the track for me. And, and, and this song mentions Jonathan and Evelyn. 
<laughs> we got we got to write all the names here to uh, don't worry i got them all i got them all. <laughs> the next song mentions marty no the no. next song next song mentions jesse okay <laughs> listen he went to a songwriting class so now, and that's what they told him to do he's just following the book anyone else get like a, a my morning jacket vibe with his vocals oh, yeah. and definitely yeah. okay the whole thing is my is a my morning jagged vibe, yeah. right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the big re- the big reverb for sure, but the, the harmonies are a little different. It like it like blooms a little differently with the harmony. Maybe Phil Eck is a big uh, you know my morning jacket reverb vocal guy because I, I guess Band of Horses kind of also have that. That's a good call. Vibe, yeah, which he which he produced. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Totally. All right, let's move on to the next song, which is called Tiger Mountain Peasant Song. Wanderers this morning came by. Where do they go? Graceful in the morning light. To banner fair, to follow. This may as well be called Precious Indie Rock Song Title. <laughs> yeah, it's just like an Elliot Smith song or something. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't really win me over with the song title. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, do you know that Tony Molina song called Sick Ass Riff? <laughs> God, yes. It kind of sounds yeah. like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like that song too. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of low points on this record. I think I mentioned this already, but I, to me, I felt like there was not a lot of wasted space or wasted sort of movement on this record, but I, this felt a little bit sort of an exercise in just wankishness. I don't know. This really, the, this song didn't quite, quite land for me. Um, it's not terrible. It's not definitely not the worst low light that we've covered by any stretch of the imagination, but it, to me, this felt a little bit sort of dull. When I'm like making fun of the fact that it's bedtime to my children, this is the song I will sing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, right, it's right around it's right around 158. Like I'll basically just bust in right there, and then they'll get angry and turn like fuck. Up. Yeah, <laughs> nice 158. Yeah, it's not bad, bad, but it, I agree. It's a uh, it feels a little. There's not much going on there. I think there's some beauty, but the acoustic guitars I wrote felt a little. Like Bach at Christmas time, it just feels a little bit by the numbers, but everything's recorded beautifully. Again, yeah, I think the quality of the acoustic guitar, that like the finger style guitar with the totally. reverb, with the reverb, is very beautiful. Yeah, for sure. It, and it's mixed; it feels really close in your ear, which is really nice. Very intimate sound. Yeah, it also doesn't have harmonies that the rest of the songs do, which kind of makes it stand out a little bit. Yeah, they broke from format, and I'm not sure it was 100% of success, but it's pleasant. It's perfectly pleasant. I, I prefer Meadowlark to this one, which I think is sort of the similar similar format, you know, but you can't you can't dig into them all. Yeah, that I, I felt similar. There, there's a few, there's two or three songs that are sort of similar to this that I think are superior, and it led me to, to feel like, okay, you've already done the solo acoustic thing a few times on this record that this feels a little bit superfluous. The last song was the low light for me where Oliver James, where he <laughs> mentions a, a whole person with two first oh, wow. names. <laughs> <laughs> Add that to Marty's list of names. Right. Uh, I got them all, baby. I got the receipts. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so, so he's talking about Jesse and Tiger Mountain. Yeah. Yeah. Towards the end, towards the end, we got, we got Jesse. It must've rhymed with something. All right, let's move it right along here to the next track on our list, which is called Your Protector. She left a week to roam, your protector's coming home, keep your secrets with you, girl, safe from the outside. 
You walk along the stream, your head caught in a waking dream. Your protectors come in home, come in home. As you The Mellotron is, I love the way it sounds for me. It's like, you want me to like a song, put a Mellotron in it. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> just push the strawberry fields button. And, right, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I think this is my favorite track on the record. Uh, I just think I, I, it's similar to like the, the, uh, the story, the journey it takes you on. Like this goes through two or three, three distinct sections. And I think it's very, feels a lot longer than four minutes to me. I noted this one as my favorite as well, although it was kind of a close call with Ragged Wood. But yeah, it has a really good build and I think a good payoff. Like the opening builds suspense effectively. They add in that tambourine and it's very rhythmically satisfying when everybody kicks in. I think a lot of the rest of the songs have a lot of melodic satisfaction. But this has the nice interplay of a drum beat with the percussion that I think continues on with definitely the acoustic guitar, which is playing a very rhythmic roll and they're kind of all syncopated together yeah i thought this was a great song and this this song had to grow on me a little bit when i first heard it the first minute or so was really it was one of those songs where if you're the kind of person that makes up their mind really quickly on a song within the first you know 20 seconds or so you could bail on this i think without knowing what's on the other side of it it's a powerful song i think it has a lot of you know, you mentioned that rhythm when it gets to the part like you run the bass and the drums are just like, dun, 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 dun. it really just has this like marching kind of feel to it that I think really works. And a couple of these songs, a couple of songs on their other albums too, have this quality where you're just like, okay. And you end up learning to expect some, something with them, you know, a minute or two into the song. And this song where they start with, at, you know, As You Lay to Die Beside Me, Baby, where it kind of pulls up and it's real, like, victorious. That contrast for the first part, it, it makes this a really good song. What was the name in the song, though? Was there a first name? <laughs> no, this is the only one on our list. This is the only one that doesn't have someone's name on it. Ah, it's garbage. I know. <laughs> Should have added, added one. It's too per. It's too personal. <laughs> it's too precious. <laughs> I know. He just calls her out as the other one. <laughs> <laughs> I, ran, I ran out of people. I only know five people. I can't. I can't add anyone else to. This song. Say, hey, baby, I wrote you a song. Oh, is my name in it? No, no, it's not. <laughs> All right, let's round things out here with our final track on the focus list, which is called Blue Ridge Mountains. <laughs> time you get to this song you, you kind of get the lyrical formula down so brother sister mother father some sort of family member some random friend's first name um in this one in this case it's sean either walking <laughs> or hiking i think it's his brother by the way <laughs> oh really okay <laughs> walking or hiking some sort of rustic structure like a cabin or a cave and then some they land- mentioned birds a lot there's a lot of land features there's a lot of 
Yeah, a lot of birds. <laughs> Devils or demons, and uh, you know, a sixty-five part harmony. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if, if only they had gotten that 66 <laughs> harmony, that might have <laughs> put it over the top. Did this remind anyone else of a Steely Dan song? I didn't pick up on that, but that's interesting. The piano riff, maybe. No, I'm talking about when the verse kicks in. It sounds like with a gun. Oh, right, right. Like, like I heard that you missed your connecting flight. That's kind of like a Steely Dan-esque delivery i guess that then, then i have seen your face before oh wow damn mind blown i didn't put that together but that, I, i'll buy that i'll allow it i'll allow <laughs> it just more uh, just <laughs> one more reason for fagan to come on the show <laughs> i'm sure he's just dying to talk about so that. i i actually don't like it when they get too church hymnal castrati church orchestra you know young boys thing i just get bored when that happens so that is a not a mode of theirs that I particularly like. Uh, my only complaint, I do think the song is well mixed. Again, it compliments to the mixer, blending the lead vocal with the acoustic guitar. And then there's a lot of variation in what parts are taking the lead throughout the, the song, the drum kit. You get a lot of bass and toms and cymbals. Maybe it was recorded, like Marty said, after the fact with individuals playing those. Then it drops back to a bass line. Like, I think there's a lot of cool mixing in it. But other than that, I just thought that it seemed like other bands could have done this song. Yeah, I hear that. I think this, I kind of go back and forth on this song. Like, there are some, I could listen to the song one day and feel like it's my favorite song on the record. And then the next day I could feel like it's sort of forgettable or that it doesn't drive to the same point. On balance, I do like the song and I think it's well constructed. I love the din 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 din. din. Like I think that's a really cool riff, and I think the piano strikes it really nicely. But it's it's not a perfect song by any means. All right. Well, I think we've given this album a bit of a post mortem here. Well, it's not really dead, but it's. We've given it a deep dive such that I feel like we can render a verdict on whether or not we think you actually need to hear this album before you die. So let's go around the horn and get our verdicts. Marty. I know what you're expecting. I'm going to say that this (laughs) album does not belong on this list based on the things I said earlier about it having diminished returns, diminishing returns, marginal utility, these economic terms. But I will admit, when this album came out, I probably listened to it over and over again 10 times a day for a month straight. (laughs) But you should not listen to it before you die. So, (laughs) so, so, (laughs) what my point is, is that the reason that it's, it has diminished to me is because I listened to it so much. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a hard right turn and say, yes, this album should be on the list. All right. Phil. So obviously we we've, you know, sort of goofed off on this record this week and obviously it's it's pretty beautiful. What I found myself thinking about this week is is it really that much better than Nora Jones Come Away With Me? Uh. Or whatever that record was, which I gave a no to. Uh and I I I, I think it is. I does I so I uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say yes. I think this is a yes. I like this record that much. I'm I'm gonna say yes. It's very calming, it's very soothing vibes. So I'm gonna give it a yes. I always have to remind myself it's it's albums you should listen to before you die. It doesn't matter, you know, I have to remember that. It's just like should someone listen to this? Of course someone should listen to this. Yeah, We're it's waiting. quite beautiful. It's quite beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're waiting for Marty's list of 1001 albums you must listen to for the 100th time. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. When, this, this, would, this would not be on that list. <laughs> got to about 65, 70, and I was like, now nah, I'm done. <laughs> Rob, what you got? Yeah, it's going to be a yes for me, too. I think this is one of those rare cases of a modern, relatively modern record where I don't need to chart where it went from here or how it influenced future music. I think on the face of it, it's a a modern production marvel. I think it's very, very well produced and done. And in addition to all the other things we've said, you know, these songs really live and die on Robin Pecknold's voice. And what I'm struck by is how confident 
they seem to be about putting his voice front and center to sell these songs. So I just think those two things combined tell me that it's a it's a really interesting artifact and it's a very beautiful listen, especially on headphones. Absolutely, you should listen to it. All right. Well, no suspense uh, here. I'll say it's it's a yes. I, I can't find anything that sounds exactly like this. I think you can find derivatives. You can find antecedents, things that this borrowed from. But the composite, I think, is very unique, in my opinion. And I sort of hate the term instant classic because it gets thrown around in sports and movies and music and all that stuff. But I do do think there's a real world possibility that in, you know, 10, 15, 20 years that this is discussed among some of those classic, like really harmony driven albums. I happen to actually like their follow up to this helplessness blues slightly better. I think it's a little bit more realized than this, but yeah, this is definitely, I, I think it's essential listening at least once it's 39 minutes. It's different. Yeah, it's a yes for me, which makes it a clean sweep. Well done, Fleet Foxes. This is uh, your crowning achievement, I'm sure, in your musical career. So <laughs> please, please accept this on our behalf. Do you guys know that they did a song with Post Malone? No, but I did see a video and I wanted to send it around, but it wasn't from this album where him and some random guy are just standing in his kitchen like, fucking wiling out to one of their songs on a different album oh weird. and he knew every single word and i wonder if maybe it was that song so i knew he was a big fan but i didn't know he made an album with them oh, not, not an album just a song just a song no i didn't know that it's called it's called love hate letter to alcohol that's why you don't know it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i won't believe he's a fan until he gets a fox tattooed on his face <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right Let's see what the old mailbag has in store for us this week. I'll, I'll turn it over to Rob to regale us. Thanks so much, Alan. Excited for the regaling that is to come. Going to dip my hand into the old mailbag, grab some of your lovely epistles. We have one here from Justin. Justin writes, great show on OK Computer. It was cool to hear one on an album I know so well. I'm not even a huge Radiohead fan, and I get fatigued by too much of Tom's warbling and sad bastardism. That said, OK Computer is their peak for me, an all-time legendary record that best represents pre-millennial angst. In other words, Marty was completely wrong, and why didn't you yell at him more? <laughs> oh, damn. I may have inserted that last oh, part. okay. Because uh, <laughs> I felt bad about myself by not yelling at Marty more. But okay, he goes on to say, there are two musical events from 1997 that top OK Computer, though. The first one is eleven twenty two ninety seven Hampton Fish Show. Oh, is that is that just uh, red meat for Phil here? Or yes, exactly. Right. I'm going to look this up right now. The <laughs> listeners have figured out how to get us to read their missives <laughs> on the air. You reference fish or you corroborate something that I've already agreed to. Okay, but he says the Hampton Fish Show happened on his 20th birthday. He was spun from doses, didn't even fully enjoy it until after the fact. Anyway, I look forward to the show every week. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I missed one. He said there are two musical events. The one was the Hampton Fish Show. The other one was Built to Spill's Masterpiece, perfect from now on, made by the very same Phil Eck that we were talking about today. He says, I'd love to hear you guys take on a Built to Spill record someday. I'm sure we'll get to him. But anyway, I look forward to the show every week. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And I look forward to this Mike's Hydrogen Week of Pog Hood <laughs> opener from 11 97 45 minutes. Yes. Roses are free. You know, Phil will be enjoying that after the show, I am certain. Uh, we have one more here. Jason writes Hey, fellas, I started listening to the podcast recently and listened to a few episodes before returning to the beginning to really get the full experience. Oh, God. <laughs> Jay, no. <laughs> listen, uh, you're not going to get the full experience unless you take a time machine back to when we were 15 years old, but I understand understand what you're talking about i've along the way i've heard many complaints about hard pan tracks and i'm a little <laughs> surprised that so far as of episode 57 no one has come to you to say that it was often because the mono mix was the one the engineers spent the most time on and to make mixes mono compatible especially in the early days of stereo albums being made 
There's a great book by Jeff Emmerich, who engineered most of the Beatles records called Here, There and Everywhere in My Life, recording the music of the Beatles that offers great insights on stuff like that. I highly recommend it. Anyway, keep up the good work. And I look forward to catching up to the present day. I don't think we ever mentioned that. No, that sounds interesting and fun. Yeah. Not just the book, which I'm curious about, but the idea that the focus was just all on the mono mix and the stereo mix was kind of an afterthought on those old records. And then maybe also that there were technical reasons that you might mix something really hard left, right, because... It, it it would it might sum to mono more easily, right? Exactly, like, in, in like a broadcast capacity. Yeah, never considered that. Sounds cool. Super interesting stuff. So thank you, Jason, for sending that along. We appreciate it. We're gonna we love to learn, and we love anything you want to tell us and inform us about that we may have gotten wrong if we had the wrong take on this Fleet Foxes record, or you want to compliment us or add to our understanding. We love it all. Please write us an email at 1001albumcomplaints at gmail.com. Especially if you are Michael or Jesse or Evelyn yeah. or John from, please email us. We need, we need some source material here to work with. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to boomerang it right back to Rob to let us know what we're in store for next week. Ah, uh, yes. Got the old Albinator here. It's been frolicking in a glade recently and is ready to spin us up our homework for the week. So without further ado, next week we shall be listening to... The artist is called Portishead. And the album is Dummy. Is that 90s? I think this is a 90s classic, yeah. I, although I have not heard it. I definitely know the name Portishead, big time. I feel like my wife is very into this album specifically. Like, I've seen this around. Female lead singer, Nobody Loves Me. I don't know what the song's called, but... the song, Yeah, the song Nobody Loves Me was a popular video on MTV uh, in the 90s. Absolutely. So excited to dive into that one. Please listen along with us. I'm going to throw it back to you, Alan. All right. Well, thanks for hanging in there with us today. With that, I am Alan. I'm Marty. I'm Phil. And I'm Rob. Boo!